Hey everyone, so today I just wanted to talk about the severe weather potential for today and tomorrow really quick. I have to head out to go somewhere in a few minutes, so I don't have a lot of time to really go into detail about all the different dynamics, everything that's going on in the atmosphere. But basically, the Storm Prediction Center currently has Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama under a enhanced and slight risk for severe weather. This, so we have a cold front moving from west to east across the United States. Once it interacts with the Gulf of Mexico, it'll begin to... Be, it'll be fueled by that warmer water, so that warmer water is going to evaporate, condense, going to be pumped into the system. This, along with moderate instability, possibly up to about 2,000 joules per kilogram, and then wind shear of about 60 knots, it'll help to fuel the... It'll... There's the potential for supercell development and isolated tornadoes. There could be a long, one or two long-lived tornadoes, but not strong. Probably about EF1, possibly reaching EF2 status for a brief period of time, but then going back down to EF1, EF0, and if it is a long-lived one at the long track, it would likely switch between EF0 to EF1. So not an EF3, EF4, EF5, nothing like that, but the potential for a tornado outbreak is there. A lot of them, like I said, are going to be isolated, They'll come down really quickly, they'll be brief, and they'll get back up. The, I think the main threat will be the wind, like straight line wind, damaging wind threat, along the frontal, leading frontal boundary of the storm because you have the outflow. That's why whenever you have a cold front that moves through, you can see the rain moving in. You can see all the scary like shelf cloud, the wall cloud, but it gets really windy right before the storm even hits. That's because as that rain falls, it displaces the air mass below it and the air mass is pushed out with the downflow, downburst, microburst, whatever, depending on the intensity of the winds. So that'll be the primary threat for everyone within really that entire area, the brown, yellow, and red area. But in the red shaded area, that is where you have the highest potential to see wind gusts of 50 knots or higher. So Within a 25 mile radius of any point in the red area, you have a 30% chance of seeing uh, those damaging winds in excess of 50 knots. And the tornado threat is the same way, which I was talking about this. So within the yellow shaded area, you have a 10% chance of seeing a tornado within a 25 mile radius of any point within that. So if you were to Mark a point anywhere within that yellow shaded area, draw out 25 miles, you have a 10% chance of seeing a tornado in that area, if that makes sense. It's a high risk. And the hail threat or potential is there. It's not as high, but in some of the supercell clusters that develop, there will be a lot of strong downdrafts and even updrafts. So depending on how strong the supercell complexes get, that'll really determine if there is enough wind in the upper levels of the atmosphere to suspend the um, ice long enough for it to grow and crystallize more before it falls. But the primary threat that pretty much everyone in the way of the storm is going to see, damaging straight line winds. And tomorrow, the Storm Prediction Center has the entire east coast under a general thunderstorm outlook that's because <clears throat> that front is going or the cold front is going to continue to move eastward the instability is not going to be as high wind shear is not going to be as high but the dynamics of frontal lifting are still there to create conditions that could favor an isolated tornado Definitely some heavy rain. I believe that at least here in South Carolina, here in the Midlands, many areas are going to see between half an inch to an inch of rain, uh, some isolated higher amounts. This is not going to be like on Friday when we caught four or five, six inches of rain because that was the area of low pressure. It was moving from the south, north, and so we had a lot of training. This will be moving from the west to east, so it'll just move through. And again, sorry if I'm going too fast. I just I have to be somewhere in a few minutes, or I have to head out in a few minutes, so I'm kind of rushing. But so today, <clears throat> these storms are developing at the moment out there 
and Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas. And you can see they'll begin to organize as that front, you know, as the southern edge of that front gets into the Gulf of Mexico and it begins to pick up that moisture. You can see it organizes. You have a lot of different supercell complexes within the squall line or the front itself. And that indicates, like I said, damaging straight line winds because the thinner that line is, the more instability you have because you have less cloud cover on the outside of it. So more heating. If the storm is more spread out, then the sunlight that reaches the ground is going to be on the outskirts of that cloud cover. So if you have a huge expanse of cloud cover, you aren't going to have as much heating potential with that energy from the sun. So the thinner that line is, it's going to be able to go across land that has been heated by the sun all day. And we're into fall right now, it's December 16th. It's not going to be 90 degrees. <laughs> it will, I know in South Carolina, I don't know for, uh, for sure about there, which I can check really quick. The temperatures, Let's see, so yeah, upper 60s, um, low 70s, that'll be enough fuel, like it'll provide enough of that energy for storm development and growth. But let's go back here, so you can see that line develops, it strengthens, and then once it interacts with the mountains, it'll begin to kind of weaken and break up before it tries to redevelop. And this doesn't look too impressive for the Midlands of South Carolina. I do believe that, or really anywhere, that line's really thin. I do believe that the line will be thin. I think that there will be a lot of scattered showers and storms right ahead and behind of it in the immediate vicinity of the front itself. But the line that when the actual front moves in, that'll be when our damaging wind threat comes into play and I think that this is a little bit underdone like all of that green you see right here I think that there will be more yellow and red on the radar when it actually occurs I think that there will be a few isolated supercell complexes I just think it'll be a little more impressive than what it's currently showing but let's see Basically, our threats here tomorrow, <clears throat> again, sorry, I'm in a rush, and I'm also kind of stuffy because it's fall. Our primary threats for tomorrow are going to be heavy rainfall, about half an inch to an inch of rain, damaging straight line winds ahead of that frontal or leading frontal boundary, and our tornado threat is not high. There could be a quick isolated spin up, but... I'm just not seeing the dynamics, which I can actually go in and see right here. <laughs> yeah, like our instability, only about 428 joules per kilogram. That's not very impressive. We will have a good amount of wind shear, possibly up to 80 knots. So it's really, I just don't think we're going to have the instability needed. We will have that upper wind shear, but I don't think we're going to have the instability needed in the heating difference. I don't think we're going to have that energy to lead to a tornado outbreak that could change. Again, I have not had a lot of time to really look at this today because I just got out the shower and everything. <laughs> but our other threat, there could be some P to quarter sized hail in some of these very isolated cells. But like I've said several times, you're all, you are all tired of hearing me say it. The primary threat will be damaging straight line winds. That's the primary threat. And I will go and I'll show you the MLK or the instability um, forecast. Let me go back. It's going to load. So as you can see with today down there in Louisiana, which I'll skip this over about right here. You can see they'll have, so MLK 1,624 joules per kilogram. Wind shear 75 knots, that is a much better environment for a tornado or supercell development. While over here in South Carolina, once the storms actually get to us, you can see the instability weakens. And we just have a very light shaded purple. So yeah, in this hour in this area, it's only showing about 338 joules per kilogram. It's not as impressive. But again, with that frontal lifting, 
So when you have a cold front move in, the air behind it is like arctic, colder, denser air. That denser air rides below the warmer, humid air, which we, in South Carolina, it's always humid here. So you're always going to have that warmer air and humid air, and that humid air is going to rise above the colder and denser air as it moves in, and that'll create your, or it'll condense into clouds, and depending on the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, in the summer when we get these cold fronts to move through, which they're rarer to get them, but when we do, these storms, they can just explode. I mean, you see the, um, like, cauliflower cloud tops, and it just goes, like an atomic bomb, essentially, a mushroom cloud. We just will not have that amount of moisture to get those type of thunderstorm clusters, but again, damaging straight line winds will be our number one issue. Um, but yeah, I do have to head out, but thank you for watching, and if anything like else comes up, I will put a post on here in a little bit. But yeah, thank you for watching.